Amen. Amen. You found the books? How about that? Miracles happen. We've, we've, we've witnessed a miracle today. This is what the book looks like. And uh, I'm just going to read chapter after chapter today. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> but we are going to talk about, um, I, I think, an important question. And that's how to live a Sunday life in a Friday world. When I was a kid in high school, uh, a friend of mine took me to a church service. And the pastor was a... Um, you know, young guy, fresh out of seminary, and he was gung-ho about bringing a message uh, to the people. And he had heard this sermon by a guy named S.M. Lockridge. Have any of you guys heard S.M. Lockridge? You know who I'm talking about. He is one of the great orators, one of the great preachers of a past generation. He could deliver the Word of God like no one else. Well, he has this sermon called, It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Have any of you heard that message? It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, he begins. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary is crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirit is burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world is winning. People are sinning. And evil is grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross, and then they raise him up next to criminals. But it's Friday. But let me tell you something, Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on a cross, feeling forsaken by his Father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My King Yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has conquered. And Satan's just a laughing. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard and a rock is rolled in place. It's Friday. It's only Friday. But Sunday is coming. Sunday has come for you and me. That stone was rolled away. And Jesus was raised. He walked out. And in that resurrection, He gave us new life. We were part of that Friday world. We were people without hope. We were people lost. People confused. People with no way out of Friday. But we didn't know as well that Sunday was coming. You recall, Jesus was very clear in His announcement of the resurrection to His disciples and His closest followers. On seven different occasions, seven, he said, I am going to Jerusalem. I am going to be handed over. I am going to be tortured, crucified, buried. But on the third day, Sunday's coming, I'm walking out of the grave. Resurrection. And yet when it happened, when Mary and the other women went to the tomb. They just thought somebody had stolen the body. They weren't thinking resurrection. They weren't thinking a brand new life. They weren't thinking about a new way. They were just thinking Friday had won and all hope 
was lost. And then they encountered Jesus, Mary Magdalene, the very first. And she questioned him, wondered if he was the gardener. And then he looked at her and said, Mary. And with those words and the tenderness in it, it reached into her heart and she recognized the resurrected Christ. And Sunday happened for her. And ever since that day, Sunday has been happening for people all over this planet. Every time a person comes to Christ by faith, Sunday happens in their life. They leave the Friday world and they are entered into this new way of life made available to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have hope. Isn't that the most wonderful thing? But here's the question. The world is still a Friday world. Nothing has changed. And as a matter of fact, as time marches on, the world seems to be declining faster. The decay has accelerated. We can just read the headline news, right? I mean... The Planned Parenthood thing, the racial tensions, the economic collapses around the world. This is a tough place. It's not a friendly place and it's not a friendly place to you and me who are living a Sunday life. So the question is this, how do we live a Sunday life in a Friday world? How do we live a Sunday life in a Friday world? I think this uh, thing is on Friday. Oh, there we go. It's Friday. Sunday's coming. We've got that. I checked that off. We've got that. Come on now. Well, we'll just throw that out the window and... Oh, there it is. Sunday's here. <laughs> Today is Sunday, right? Yeah, okay. We're, we're together. Sunday's here. How do we live a Sunday life in a Friday world? Well, what I want to spend a few moments on this morning is talking about the nature of of this world that we live in. We're different, aren't we? As believers in Christ, we are different. And and let's just quickly go over what makes us different. Okay? So, each of you, I pray, have had an encounter with Christ Jesus. You have come to know Christ in a very personal and real way. For me, it happened when I was... Uh, between my 6th and 7th grade years at a summer youth camp. It was my first grace encounter. I went to this youth camp to have fun, to experience just, you know, friendship and lots of cool things. I wasn't there because I was asking spiritual questions. I wasn't, you know, wondering why I was here, who I was, or where I was going in life. I was just there to have fun, but on that last night... Jesus knew what my real need was, and he made it known to me. He reached out to me in grace and said, whatever you think this week has been, it's about this moment. Me letting you know that I love you, that I've taken away your sins, and that I've come that you can have life everlasting, and I want to be in your life. And boy, I was moved as I have never been moved in my life, and I prayed to receive Christ. Now, at that moment, I had no earthly idea what happened. I had no earthly idea the God side of that equation. I had no earthly idea that I had been made new, that I had been given a new heart, that I was released from the law of sin and death, the walk in the newness of life in this new covenant. I had no idea that the Holy Spirit had come to live inside of me. None of that was a part of that evening. 
as far as my mind was concerned. But as far as God was concerned, that's exactly what happened. In the day that you trusted Jesus, the exact same thing happened to you. You were made new. You had died in Christ. You were buried in Christ and you had come alive in Christ to walk in the newness of life. God's Spirit had come to live inside of you. That's what makes you different. It's not all the good stuff that you do. It's not because you pray or read your Bible. What makes you different is the fact that Jesus Christ has invaded your heart and soul and He is going to be with you forever. Isn't that great news? You know Moses when he was uh, in the wilderness had gone up to Mount Sinai and he had received the old covenant, those ten commandments and he had brought that down to the people and said... God said this, if you will obey all of my statutes and commands, then he will be our God and we will be his people. And and all the people of Israel stood there listening and they said, all that God has commanded, we will do. They had been given a law. They had been given a covenant. And everybody thinks that's what distinguished the people of Israel from every other nation. But if you move forward in the book of Exodus to Exodus 33 and 34, Moses is having this conversation with God. And, and he's saying, you know, who are you? And, and, and you know, it's, it's, God is saying, I'm going to be with you. And Moses made this statement. He said, if you don't go with us, We are nothing because it's your presence among us as a people that distinguishes us from every other nation. It wasn't the covenant. It wasn't those laws written on tablets of stones. It was the very presence of God. What distinguishes you as an individual in this world? It's the fact that Jesus Christ is alive, living in you. What distinguishes this body from any other group that gathers together uh, around a certain cause? It's the fact that Jesus is here with us. His glory is in our midst. But this life that we've been called to live, we live it as foreigners and aliens in this world. And the world that we live in is against us. It is under the control of Satan. It is based on the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. That's what the world system is. And wherever you are on planet earth, you cannot escape that world system. It bombards you. Turn on television, you see the world system at play. Go to a movie, you see the world system at play. Enter into the workforce, you see the world system at play. Send your kids off to public education. You see the world system at play. Look at what's happening in our government. You see the world system at play. Look at the economic and financial condition of this world. You see the world condition at play. You see that world system very active. And within that world system, as John writes in his first letter, is the spirit of Antichrist. We're looking for a single person that we can label as the Antichrist. That person will show up, but the spirit is already here. It has been here for since the very beginning, right? It entered into this world in the garden. 
and this world system was put into play at the tree of knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan made that tree look good to the eyes, desirable, and something to have. And Adam and Eve bought into that world system. They said no to life and yes to death. And that's what that world system is all about. We try to measure it in terms of good and evil. Right and wrong. But no matter how we try to measure the world system, it really is simply sin and death. And that's what we were rescued out of. Sin and death. So that we could experience life in Christ. So that world system, what is it? It's a world that is based on the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not from the Father. So how do we define the world? Well, in simple terms, it's everything that is not from the Father. That's the world system. We know that everything that came from the Father is good. Every gift that he bestows is for our benefit, for our well-being. It's to enable us to experience this new life that we've been called to live as children of God. That's all the stuff from the Father. Anything that attacks this new life that we have in Christ is not of the Father and therefore is of the world. And the three things, the three categories that that can be summed up in are the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. That world is going to pass away, isn't it? That world system is going to come to an end. But in the meantime, we're called to live a new life in this world of darkness. It's tough, isn't it? It can be a daunting task. We can lose our footing, can't we? We can sometimes stumble and give in. How many of you have ever felt down? This looks like a very happy group, so I don't think that's probably been the case for you guys. You know, it's, it's always joy and love and happiness and smiles, right? That's Lubbock, huh? Yeah. Any of you been down, experienced the blues? You can raise your hand. Close your eyes so that nobody will see. What happens when we get down? What happens to us? Well, here's what happens to me. I start doing the woe is me thing. Have you ever done the woe is me? Gosh, life isn't fair. It's tough. I, I just need a little happiness. And, and, and that's when my hand starts reaching back for my wallet and the credit card and thinking, gosh, I need a new golf driver. You know, that, that could bring me some happiness. Or, man, I need a new set of clothes. And, you know, my old stuff, I just don't feel right in it. And, you know, some new clothes would make me feel good. And for most guys, we go for the big ticket items. Now, women usually go for the smaller ticket items, which the guys explode over. You paid $50 for a new outfit and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we do all that kind of thing. And they're saying, well, you... Paid, you know, $15,000 for a new car? Well, that's different, right? But, but we get down into that area of self-pity. And, and when we get down into that area of self-pity, the things of the world start looking a little nicer to us. 
It's just the way it is. I know pastors. I mean, I've, I've, I've known them personally. I've, I've walked with them. I've been involved in their lives where they've gotten down into that area of self-pity. And what looked good to them to bring them happiness was an affair. And, and they've chosen to have affairs. Well, why? Because they were down. They started feeling blue. Life was tough. They felt isolated, alone. Nobody liked them. Everybody hated them. It's like the guy that woke up one morning and looked over at his wife and said, I'm not going to church today. I don't want to go. Those people don't like me and I don't like them. I'm not going. The wife said, but, but honey, you have to. You have to go. No, I don't want to go. I'm not going. Just give me one good reason why I should go to church today. You're the pastor. <laughs> A lot of pastors get isolated and alone and feel like they don't have true, genuine friendships and they get to that place of self-pity and woe is me and those thoughts. I could just use a little pleasure, something that would bring some happiness into this parched soul. And they have affairs. And, and, and we're all like, you know, how could that happen? Well, we all get down, don't we? We all can get to that point of self-pity. We can all get to that point of saying, gosh, I, I just wish I could have a little happiness in my life. And at that point, we become vulnerable to the ways of the world. The desires of the flesh. The desires of the eyes. The boastful pride of life. Being proud of the things that you have and get to do. That's not what Christ set us free to do. He raised us up to walk in the newness of life. So how do we stay down that path? Oz Guinness is a, I guess, a culturalist. He's a thinker, an observer of, of life. He's written a number of books. He commentates on kind of the world system and politics. And he has a great book called The Free People's Suicide. And the subtitle is How to Sustain Freedom in the World Today. And it's a commentary, a modern commentary on America today. So when the founders of this country were thinking about freedom, they were thinking about it through three different channels. First, winning freedom. They wanted to win their freedom from British rule. So the Revolutionary War was fought and freedom was won. The second thing they thought about was how to order freedom. And that's where the Constitution came into place. They wrote these incredible documents to bring order to this freedom that they just won. And then the third aspect of it was how to sustain this freedom. America is a great experiment of freedom. How can we sustain it not only for this generation, for the next, for the next, for the next, and for the next. And that's what this gospel message is all about. It's about a freedom that has been won for us in Christ. Jesus set us free through his death, burial, and resurrection. He ordered this freedom by this new covenant in which we live in today. And then he assures its sustainability by his very presence living in us. That's how it's sustained by Christ's 
presence. He's our hope of glory in this world of darkness. There's no way that we can sustain freedom through human effort. There's no way that we can fight the world system in our own strength. There's no way that we can punch the devil in the face and escape. For our freedom to be a sustained freedom, there has to be a reliance upon God's presence in us. That's the only way that we can pierce the darkness of this world. That's the only way that we can be the light as God has called us to be when we reflect the very light of God Himself living in us. It's the only way. There's no other way. Now you know why the Bible from beginning to end The message to us is always this, and it's never anything else. It's always this, trust God. Live by faith. Walk in the Spirit. Those are all different ways of saying the same thing. The one thing that God has asked of you is a life of faith. That's the message of this book, Simple Gospel, Simply Grace. You know, I missed the way of grace for a number of years. I struggled with the Christian life. The temptations of the world kept winning. I finally threw up my hands and said, Lord, I give up. I can't be your guy. I can't do this. And it was at that moment that I learned about the indwelling presence of Christ. And things began to change. And I realized that the way of the Christian life wasn't through human effort. It was by faith. So God's plan for you is simply this. By grace through faith. By grace through faith. By grace through Through faith. God reaches out to you in grace. In the person and work of Jesus Christ. That does something within us to engender a response of faith. And that's what God wants from us in all situations. For us to simply respond to the grace of God that is ours by faith. Why? Because that's when we're trusting the very presence of God living in us. It's that simple. It is really that simple. God's equipped us with truth. The Holy Spirit brings that truth to mind. Renews our mind. We're relying on the Spirit to do that. Truth isn't something that we just learn as facts. Truth is Christ. He is the one full of truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We need the Holy Spirit to bring the truth of God, the truth of Jesus to our minds. So what does God call us to do in this world that we live in today? To simply abide. To walk by faith, to trust. It's always by grace, through faith. He's equipped us with truth. He's attached us to a body of believers. Isn't that great news? That we're not alone. I mean, we have God's presence, but we also have one another as believers in Christ. We're a part of a body. And have you noticed... That you can't love in a vacuum. Isn't that right? God has called us to faith, hope, and love. Well, what if nobody's there to love? And you know, many Christians isolate themselves. You know, they they pull away from other believers. They don't want any part of other believers. Gosh, we need each other. We need the body. 
It's within the body that we really see the fullness of Christ operating among each other. We need each other. So we've been equipped with truth. We've been placed in the body. And then we have God's presence living in us. We've been equipped to live a Sunday life in a Friday world. What's our part? What's our role? To simply walk by faith. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, one of the great scenes in the Bible. He goes under the water, a dove descends, a voice from heaven is heard. This is my son whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up on this mountain, and Jesus is transfigured before them. And Peter starts to talk. You know, Peter loved to talk. And, and have you ever just been... You know, in a group of people, and there's this awkward silence, and, and, you, and you think, you know, somebody's got to say something, and nobody's saying anything, so you start blabbing your mouth, have no earthly idea what's coming out, but you want to break that awkward silence? Well, that was Peter all the time, 24-7. You know, this is, this is kind of awkward. I, I'm nervous. I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to talk. And it's, it's as if Jesus didn't even recognize it and then there's this voice from heaven again this is my son whom I'm well pleased listen to him how do we live a Sunday life in a Friday world simply that listen to Jesus you have a problem in your life you have a situation that you have no earthly idea what to do. Listen to Jesus. Don't try it on your own. Don't try to figure it out through human understanding. It doesn't work. You're going to fall flat on your face. And, and the thing about us as believers... Lots of times we think we have it all figured out as to what the outcome should be in a situation. I was in a situation a number of years ago. It was one of the toughest things that I've ever experienced in life. And I kept thinking to myself, love is supposed to win. Love is supposed to win. I mean, we all know the passage in 1 Corinthians, don't we? Love is patience, lo love is kind, and all of those. And it gets to the end, and it says, love never fails. So love somehow is supposed to win out in this situation. Now, here's what I did. I figured out how it was supposed to win out. I came up with this scene as, as to what that was going to look like. And then I started working toward that end. Not by faith in Jesus Christ, but through human effort. Where did it lead me? To a hospital bed with blood pressure off the charts. Doctors and nurses thinking I'm about to stroke out. Why? Because... Even though I had the truth, the knowledge of the truth, and I had this picture, and I had this noble outcome, love wins, and a scene as to how that was going to work out, I went about it in the energy of the flesh. I was trying to solve a spiritual problem that I had attached a spiritual solution to through a worldly way. Doesn't work. How do we live a Sunday life in a Friday world? We recognize that Jesus is our hope. We pin all that we are 
and all that we have to him. It's his presence. It's his power. It's his love. It is his grace. It is his mercy. It is his righteousness that is going to win out. That's why Paul wrote these words. I want you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, there's lots of people that will just take that part of that passage and lift it out and say, see here, you better get after it. It says right there to work it out with fear and trembling. And if you're not working it out, it means you've lost it. It's a verse that they say teaches that you can lose your salvation. It's like, have you not read the next verse? I mean, really, have you not read the next verse? Because there is a next verse. And whenever there's a next verse, it usually helps explain the verse that you just read. That's the funny thing about Bible study. But the next verse says, because it is God who is at work in you to do and to will of His good pleasure. What do we work out by faith? Simply what God is working in us. What is God working in us? The truth about His love, His grace, His mercy, His righteousness. And let us not mistake, it's His. When you read the Bible, we've got all these characters in the Bible, right? You know, we've got... Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and all these these crazy prophets. And then we get into the New Testament and we meet Matthew and Luke and Paul and John and James. And there's these just great stories and the women of the Bible and, you know, how they are, are, are a part of it. But who's the main character? The main character is Jesus. Who's the main character in your life? And when you trust the main character, this Sunday life shines brightly in a Friday world. Well, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for truth. Thank you so much for a body that we're connected to. And thank you so much for your presence living in us. You are our hope of glory. You are our hope of living a Sunday life in a Friday world. You are the main character in our stories. And I just thank you so much that through your death, burial, and resurrection, you rescued us. You took us out of the story of the world and placed us into your story of resurrection. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you that we have this awesome, incredible privilege of taking up our place in your story and being used by you to pierce the darkness of this world with your love, your grace, your mercy, your freedom, your life. And I pray as you work through us that more and more people will be rescued out of this present evil age so that they can participate in the divine nature and to know you personally and to experience your love in abundance. And we thank you for all of this in Christ's matchless name. Amen. Amen. You guys go ahead and stand with us.
of sin and darkness whose love is mighty is so much stronger the king of glory the king above our king who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me You guys have a great week.